2014. My name is Cheryl Walker. I'm with the Illinois State Library and I am interviewing Marie Honeywell. Marie was born March 23, 1953 in New York City, New York. Uh, Marie s served in the U.S. Army, Women's Army Corps from 1974 to 1977. Marie, would you like to tell your story at this time? Yes, I would like to uh, tell a, a little bit about female veterans and yeah. why we've decided to join the military. Okay, we'd love to hear it. Thank you. Uh, just briefly, I thought it was important to do this interview because I think we have a lot of misconceptions about uh, the military. We're, we're a very small percentage of the, the U.S. population and in today's society a lot of people don't understand what our function is or, or what we do. But I believe that the females especially, we have always been volunteers. We have never been drafted, we have never been required to do service. So any female that comes in is doing it of her, of her own volition. And the reason I went in was because uh, my father served in World War II Navy, my brother served Vietnam Navy, and uh, I grew up on John Wayne movies and I wanted to continue serving my country as not only as a Girl Scout and serving community, but then serving uh, on, a, on a different level. Uh, I wanted my education to continue. Uncle Sam uh, basically paid for my bachelor's and my master's in business when I had gotten out of the service in 1977. And I also got enormous amount of benefits, uh, not only the medical, but I married a career officer. And as a dependent, I, I have a, a comfortable life. And I just wanted to, to tell people that you do the service because it's important to you. It's not because the pay is good. It's not because the, the, the hours are good or the work conditions are good. Because in, in a lot of ways, uh, we, we go through an awful lot, especially when our family members go to war, and then we worry about whether they're coming back. So me personally, I went in when I was 21 years old, and I got to do the best job there was, air traffic control, and I was a tower operator. And I met my husband down at Fort Meade, excuse me, Fort Rucker, Alabama. And uh, my first duty station was, was Fort Meade, Maryland. And that's between Washington, D.C. and Baltimore. So I got to uh, work with Army air traffic, and I also got to work with the civilian uh, flying club that was stationed there. Uh, about a year doing that, then I transferred to South Korea. My husband was on orders, so I followed him uh, three or four months after he got there. And I was part of the 284th Aviation Company, correction, 284th ATC Company. And we provided air traffic control operators all over the, the country of South Korea. And my job was to uh, be on the airfield that my husband flew out of, which was by special permission, that I was assigned in the tactical zone. I was the first woman from my company to be assigned to a tactical zone. And uh, they wanted to make sure that the situation would work out. Uh, I was there, got to do extraordinary things. Uh, not only did air traffic control with uh, the U.S. pilots, but it was rather interesting to do air traffic control to uh, Korean pilots that did not necessarily speak English. So we had a very interesting mix of uh, air traffic that we would control around our, our flying area. Uh, we were outside Camp Red Cloud, which was a uh, I Corps uh, command, and uh, about one one hour north of Seoul. What was unique about it is not only my husband and I were stationed on the same airfield in Weijangbu, Korea, but my two sisters were also stationed in Korea at that time, and they were down in Seoul. My one sister was in computers, and uh, my other sister was actually in um, the supply end of it. She was a uh, sergeant uh, that took care of the UN compound 
down in, uh, in, in Seoul, Korea. So not only did I have the ability to do the best job, the most exciting career you could have, but I had my family near me. Uh, we made Korean friends. We lived on the economy, so we invited our Korean friends over every Tuesday night, and we would get together and uh, help them with their English, and we would talk about America. And uh, my husband was politi political science major, so we would talk about politics, what's going on in the U.S. And the Korean people were absolutely fabulous. I mean, I'm just was so amazed when I first got there. I could not even hear or understand the sounds of the language and by the time I left I was speaking phrases and I was going to the market buying my my food and my groceries at the local market speaking to Koreans so it was it was an unusual experience it was great uh, I guess my point is that when I was there and and all around the military even when we got back to the the United States uh, there's always been something unique about each assignment. And for Korea, I got to do some really great things. I got to fly in the helicopters, of course. I actually got to fly uh, with one of the pilots that was introducing a new pilot to the DMZ because um, the DMZ is actually a uh, divider between North and South Korea, and it, it changes positions uh, while you're going over mountains and such. So it was very important for the pilots to know which side of the fence they had to uh, fly on. So I got to go. That was the only day I did not have a camera. And I got to uh, enjoy that. And uh, we traveled a little bit of the country. We went down to the southern part and uh, saw Pusan, which is the one of the, uh, the harbors down in South Korea. A uh, couple things that were were more serious uh, vein was uh, that before I had gotten there, uh, first of all, Vietnam was still going on. And April of 75, my husband was there, and that's when Saigon fell. And uh, he was in South Korea, and the whole country went on alert because we did not know as a country if we were going to go back into South Korea. Not correct, excuse me, to back into Vietnam. And that's really what it is. You're always on alert. You're always ready to go. And uh, when I had gotten there, I had heard stories about pilots that had flown over the DMZ and gotten on the wrong side of the fence. And uh, once they started coming back to the safe side, they had a few bullet holes in the in the fuselage of the the helicopter so although it was a non-combat area there was still things going on my hun my husband and i finished our tour there we came back to the united states within a couple days or a week the incident took place where uh the u.s soldiers and and i believe i'm not sure whether it was South Koreans and U.S. soldiers had gone into the demilitarized zone to cut down some trees because it was blocking the view of of their um, security issue. And uh, basically what happened is, as this story was told, the, the North Koreans came and they actually murdered them. And there was this big incident and the whole country went on alert again. And my husband and I had just gotten back from there and both of us because we spoke about it, were of the mind that we would turn around and get on a flight and go back and serve in that country if that's what it took. Because we had just completed a year's worth of, of mission and we knew the areas and we knew the, the, the lay of the land and we knew our jobs. Luckily, it did not turn into an international incident. We did not have to do anything on a national level. But that just shows me that although it's a peacetime operation, if you want to call it that, that there's still danger. So uh, 
that was that was a life-changing event for me being outside the country learning a language learning a culture uh, taking college classes uh, courtesy of tuition assistance uh, in another country uh, taught by people that were renowned renowned professors and, and, and you know very well-known people when we got back to uh, the CONUS, which was the United States, uh, my husband was assigned to Fort uh, Gordon, Georgia. And that was a good assignment for him because he's a uh, signal officer. And uh, I went that way and I had an alternative job, which was a flight operations. And basically, if you think of flight operations, it's the person that takes care of the schedule of where the helicopters are going and coming back and and you're, you're, you're the router and, and you're keeping track of the, the schedule. So I was assigned to Fort Gordon Airfield, Fort Gordon um, Air Station, and uh, it was just a small field so that was where I was told I could not work with my husband because we would have been in the same command and he, being an officer, would have what been one of my um, superiors. So in that regard, um, even in the military, you know, you go job hunting. And, and uh, I basically was called by the command sergeant major of the uh, post for Fort Gordon at his office, and they said, we need somebody to come and take care of the sergeant major's, you know, uh, office, you know, uh, take care of a schedule, you know, make sure things are done. And uh, so I went in for an interview and it was rather unique because I told the command sergeant major, I was, I said, you know, you're looking for a receptionist, a clerk. I said, I, I didn't have any formal training in that. And he goes, specialist, he says, you can learn, can't you? And I said, yes, sergeant major, I can learn. And that's what the army taught me. It doesn't matter what you're given. If you go into air traffic control, you are trained to do a job. If you go to Korea, they send you to the motor pool and they tell you what you need to do. Uh, so whatever the challenge is, and you might be a little bit uncomfortable with it, like they made me the training NCO of, of uh, the facility in South Korea where I was at, and uh, that was unusual because I'm, I, made a plan and we had weekly, you know, uh, learning going on. It was required, you know, that all the people that were uh, there uh, have some kind of learning. And uh, what was unique about it was that uh, I started keeping weekly records and of all of the service people so that we could document that they had X amount of hours of training. And when the international team came to inspect the training records, they told my boss and they told me that it was the best records that they had ever seen. <laughs> and I was kind of taken aback by that because I was thinking, oh, well, you know, that, that's, a little, that's a little strange, you know, because I didn't, I didn't think it was all that, you know, I, it, it wasn't that difficult for me, you know, but that was a major compliment. And they did send a uh, letter to my company. Uh, I don't know what the right word would be, whether it was not a letter of appreciation or a letter of commendation, something that was not an official type thing because it never got in my records, but it was an actual uh, letter stating that they were very impressed with the training facility and the, the routine we were keeping, and, and I was very proud of that. So uh, there's been so many moments where having served in the military, I pride myself on, on being a good soldier. And when I wore my uniform, I wore it with pride, and it was always clean and presentable. And when I worked for the sergeant major, we worked uh, just below the general, who was the commander of the Fort Gordon. And I thought that that was a, a very unique situation. And that's why I guess I, I have such an appreciation for leadership. So the military is, is where I, I really blossomed as an individual and, and learned the full extent of, of some of my capabilities. But as everyone else, I'm still learning, and I'm still a little timid about new challenges sometimes. But uh, when I see these young sailors coming through Great Lakes, or I see any anybody that served in the military, I thank them as one veteran to another for continuing to, to, to hold the torch. 
especially the young people and the, the young women veterans that come in, I say to them, you are doing a much important job and you are going to be looked at and you are going to be measured and you need to uphold our tradition. And that's where the Women's Army Corps came in. I was one of the last couple years that we were still in existence and I'm very proud of that. And so now I'm active with uh, veteran organizations. I'm active with the uh, Veterans Court here in uh, Ninth Judicial District of uh, Lake County, Illinois. And I'm uh, basically, as a career, you know, after I got out of the military, you know, being a mom and being a wife, I've always been very closely aligned with the military. And in, in that respect, I was able to enjoy the, the gifts that I received and, and enjoy the, the growth that I made. And then I used it for my, my community here. Not only the military community, but my church community. My, I taught special education for the last 20 years. Uh, after I got out of the military, um, Uncle Sam paid for my bachelor's and master's in business. So I went into the corporate world for about 12 years and set up million dollar payrolls for ADP. And so I've, I've had a lot of good adventures. And I really feel that serving your country should not be just a few people. I think that it would be beneficial to open it up to uh, more people and to give people the pride of, of serving community. You went into the service in a time that was a controversial time mm -hmm. where women were still looked down upon going into service a mm -hmm. little bit. The, yes, it was a very much of a, a bias. Um, my dad is, like I said, World War II, Navy, old school, you know, uh, born 1917. He was a young man in his 20s when he was in the war. But when I told him, because I needed his permission to sign, I was just a couple months short of 21, his first comment, and you'll have to take it in context, was that, why do you want to go into the military? Only women that are either gay or that are, are if you want to call them floozies or loose women, are go into the military. And I looked at him and I said, Dad, I said, you and Mom, taught me values. You and mom taught me who I am. I said just because I go and work in the military or I work anywhere does not mean I'm going to change my values. I said I want to go because it's an opportunity to be trained as an air traffic controller. What kid out of New York City, 21 years old, a female, got to be trained as an air traffic controller? I was FAA certified. I could have continued on as a civilian uh, going to the FAA school. Uh, today they're trying to uh, make a lot of the military jobs certified so that when you do get out of the service that you don't have to go through the training again, that you were recognized. Way back when they didn't do that. And I think that, that has hurt a lot of our current uh, people from coming out that have immense experience and leadership and and you know management experience but they don't have that that college degree or they don't have that that stamp of approval from a certified program or something and I think there's a lot of things that we need to to do today to support our military our military families and anytime somebody you know needs me to step up all I have to do is ask what made you decide to be an air traffic controller? It was interesting because um, when I was young, uh, I used to love to read. And uh, I remember reading a story about a English woman in World War II that was an air traffic controller. And I can't even remember what the book was or, or the author or the title, 
But for some reason, it's stuck in my mind all those years that that would be something that I would like to do. When I grew up as a, um, uh, a kid, a child, I was a tomboy. And I would always be out doing sports with the boys in the neighborhood, and we would play army in the in the in the back lot. And they would say, "Oh, well, you could be the nurse," you know, uh, which was traditional at that time. And I said, "No, I'm not going to be the nurse. I want to be the French Resistance. I want to, you know, I want to be there, you know, doing what you guys are doing, you know." So even from a young age, I was never. I never felt like I had to be pigeonholed or I had to fit in somebody's box. So in that respect, when, when the opportunity came, I was actually playing uh, field hockey on, on Long Island. Uh, this was when I was in college. And uh, my sister and I were playing field hockey and it was an all women's league. And she said to me, do, do you know that that person, Carol over there, she's, she's, a, she's a US Army. She's Women's Army Corps. And I said, really? So I went over and I spoke to her and I said, well, what do women really do in the military? You know, and she says, well, you see what I do right now. My assignment is recruiting and, uh, you know, on, on the weekends I'm here playing field hockey with you and I moved back to New York City because my parents are getting older and they needed me to be close by. So she was combining her family needs with, with her career and she was the type of person she would never come to you and recruit you or or try to do a sales job if you spoke to her and asked her about the military and that you were interested she would provide you the information she would make sure that at the time in 73 is when i signed up and went active duty 74 that uh, all females had to have high school diplomas we had to take the same asvap uh, test as the men and there were only so many jobs that we would qualify for because the combat roles weren't open. And, and I, I, as an individual, would not have wanted to do that. So, I mean, that was not what I, I was advocating for. But the thing is, as a, as a independent woman, uh, I understand why people that are like me, we, we don't like to feel restricted. If you have the ability to do something, if you have the leadership ability, if you have the intelligence, if you have what it takes, why not look at the individual as opposed to looking at whether you're a man or a woman? And that's, I guess, how I've always been through the years. So being on Long Island in uh, summer months, uh, get up and the Air Force jets, the, the Air Guard, we're flying overhead every morning, and every morning I'd look at them and I'd go, I want to do that, you know? And it was almost like a reminder or, or something that every day, every day, every day. And then when I met Carol in the fall, that, that particular fall, we were playing field hockey, then I started investigating it. And I think that was pretty much the time I decided to stop going through college on my own because I had no direction and then go into the military and I told my father I said it's three years it's three years they're gonna train me they're going to give me a place to live they're going to you know they're gonna take care of me and then after three years if I don't like it I don't stay and the only reason I didn't stay was because I married a career man and it would be increasingly more difficult to you know keep our assignments going in the same direction but um, I think it's still a good option for today's youth. And even as a special ed teacher these last 20 years, I tell the students, I said, listen, if you have a mind to do this, you know, if you, want, if you have a passion that you want to serve your community, your country, and, and you want some, you know, someone to help you with your education and your training and such, I said, consider the military. But if you, if you go into the military, then basically you make the commitment. You know, it, it's not like, oh, I guess I don't like this and I'm, I'm, you know, I won't stay. No. It's a life commitment and it's a lifestyle. And that's what my family has done, all of us. So. Out of your brothers, your, your brothers, brothers, your brothers, sisters, and sisters, mm -hmm. who, 
who and yourself, who were career? Well, my husband, like I said, was 22 years a helicopter pilot. He, he flew for the Army about 10 years, and then he made a transition, and then he flew for the Coast Guard for the last 12 years. So he did a 22 year, and he's retired. My older sister, Chris, uh, basically is a 30 year veteran, Army. She went in during the world, uh, the Vietnam era time uh, as a kid, you know, a young person. And she did 30 years and she got out as an E-9, which is top of the enlisted. And for a woman to be a command sergeant major is a big deal. And even to this day, she still lives out in the state of Washington, my sisters. Uh, she gets a lot of respect from the other veterans, both men and women, because she had achieved that rank and that goal. And then my other sister, Kathy, uh, was a 20-year veteran, and she initially went in as, as to, into computers, and that's, she was in the computer field, doing more of the programming and the software end of it. And then uh, she was the one that got caught in 1990-91, the first Gulf War, and she actually had gotten hurt and they had to ship her back to Germany for some uh, medical attention. And then when she came back to the States, they had to continue, you know, some medical attention. You know, um, so both of my, my sisters are disabled veterans. Uh, luckily, my husband and I are, you know, we're healthy. Uh, my son, like I said, you know. Oh, my younger brother, who actually followed us, you know. Um, I went into the Army. My sisters went in, you know, we did Army. My younger brother was Army. He did Army, and then uh, he's in El Paso, Texas. That's where he settled with his family. And uh, he actually went to Iraq twice, with which was the recent conflicts. And then uh, my son, uh, my firstborn, he's about 33 now, he went to Afghanistan and Iraq with the 101st Airborne. They were the first in. Uh, my firstborn was going to war, and I said to him, I said, sweetheart, I said, we, were, I raised you as a good person, and you're Christian, and according to Christian laws, you know, we, you do not kill people. I said, but if it comes down to you as a soldier versus the enemy as a soldier, mm -hmm. I want to see you at home. And I, I felt as a parent, I had to give him my permission or my blessing or to say I will still love you no matter what you have to do and to this day I think that that was something that that you need to you need to tell your family you know uh, it's it's not easy so he came back and he's he's fine and he married a, a Navy girl so they're down in Norfolk Virginia and I have a grandson who's five so he, he's the light of my life that's pretty cool. Where did you take your basic? It was Fort McClellan, Alabama, and we were all women. And since I had come out of Girl Scout camp and I was used to, to living with two and three hundred females at the same time, I found no problem with that. It was like it was like being in scout camp again. And I tell people that the drill instructors, which were women drill instructors, were pussy cats compared to my Girl Scout leader. <laughs> <laughs> who was also my camp director. I said, oh, no, it was, it was like being back at scout camp, you know, and, and we had the required training, you know, the, the classes and the marching and, and how to, you know, etiquette and uniforms and everything like that. And uh, it, it was an experience. But it, it goes by the eight weeks, you, you never get to rest because you're getting up, Early in the morning, either to pull KP duty before you get in ready formation, or you're getting in formation so that you can march off to school. So you're getting up early in the morning, which I'm not a morning person per se. And then the lights go out, I'd say probably about 9 o'clock at night or something. You know, officially lights are out, everybody's supposed to go to bed. Well, when the drill instructors left, everybody pulls out their flashlights and they're shining their brass and they're polishing their boots and, and we're studying our materials. And so by the time you stay up at night and, and you're studying, you're doing things and then you've got to get up at 5 in the morning or 5.30 in the morning, 
had a lot of very tired people, but it was rather interesting though. I, I, I truly enjoyed it. And, and I made some uh, good friends that also went to Fort Rucker and also went into air traffic control. Do you so. still see them? No, um, because I've traveled all over with my husband, um, I, there are some people that I still know about. The actual person that was the recruiter who brought me in, she belongs to the same WAC organization that I do, which is stationed out of Fort McClellan, Alabama. And occasionally we'll talk or, or we'll send messages on, on the, you know, whether through email or Facebook or something like that. But uh, my sisters, you know, through them, because of their uh, association, and they had a different path, um, I have met female generals, I have met female, you know, uh, command sergeant majors, I have met women in leadership positions. Uh, one of our uh, friends is the head of the Veterans Administration in the state of Washington, you know, and, and she was a uh, female, you know, uh, I think she was Navy, not Navy, a nurse. Uh, so there's a few of us that are still kicking. You know, and uh, we have a uh, female uh, organization here in Lake County. It's called um, American Legion, and it's a women's only post. We've got 15 members, and all of those ladies of World War II, or most of them that I know of. And so they're getting older, and, and our fear is that when they are gone, we're going to lose that connection and we're going to lose those stories and we're going to lose that 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 uniqueness and so those are the kind of people that I would try to to get in touch with to say you know what you need to make sure you come out and you tell your story because there'll be nobody to tell their story you know so we've, we've got a lot of unique things here in Lake County Illinois you know veterans court uh, veteran organizations that are very uh, you know, service oriented to the community and also to the veterans and their families. So I, I'm still working. I'm officially retired as a, as a teacher, although I still hold my credentials. But um, now it's time to turn my attention to servicing the veteran community. And Lovell here is an excellent source of uh, services. We have a women's wellness program, a women's health program here that is unique and since Lovell is a combination of the U.S. Navy having merged with the VA hospital that was here currently used to be the, the North Chicago VA, uh, I think that we have the best facility in this particular area. And so I feel very blessed that we can offer services to our veterans and their families. There's a lot of things that a lot of veterans like myself served a few years and they go back into civilian society and they sort of forget that they served and they sort of forget that they're entitled to services or or that you know they should feel honored and it doesn't matter which era they were in or which war they were in or what their personal experiences are you sign on the dotted line uncle sam owns you 24 7 for however long you give them and that is a, a lifetime commitment, and I think that's something to be proud of. So, well, Marie, it's, you say here that you have a Na National Defense Medal and a Korean Defense Service Medal. Are there any other medals that you obtained? Um. Basically, they put down the usual, the marksman type thing, you know, for, for firing weapons and such. But uh, what was interesting about that, uh, the Korean Service Defense Medal, mm -hmm. has only recently, within the last couple of years, has that been approved and given to people that served in Korea, but we were not in the Korean War. Because there's a Korean Conflict Medal like if, if I had served in the 1950s, uh, I, would have that, I would have had that medal. But since I served in Korea, it's called the Korean Defense Medal. So that's kind of unique. And that's another thing. When I was in Korea, 
Uh, do you remember uh, there was a TV series called MASH? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, that whole scenario was uh, actually pretty true to form because I lived in Weizhangbu where the MASH unit was originally and was still actually there assigned. So although the TV show talked about the 1950s, there was a MASH unit in the 1960s, 1970s, I believe, where, near where we were. And that was like our favorite show to watch because we watched military uh, TV, even, even over in Korea. Hmm. So it was rather unique. And they, they did. They talked about Camp Red Cloud, and that was real. And they talked about Wee Zhang Bu, and that was real. So I was living there. <laughs> so it was, it was kind of neat. But uh, as far as medals, no, uh, like I said, I think doing a good job and, and being recognized for being a good soldier and upholding the values of, of what they call, whether it's the Army values or whether you're a Navy, um, I think that, that gives me more pride than, than hanging any kind of medal on my, on my uh, jacket. Mm -hmm. You know, um, may I get something? I just, yes. I have my hat over here. Mm -hmm. I specifically did not wear any particular uniform for a veteran organization because I belong to American Legion, VFW, Women's Army Corps, and you know how do you how do you express all of the the different ones? So I just say veteran service offices, veteran services. You know that's what we do. But in relation to my hat, I'm very proud because I belong to the Women's Honor Society for Women Veterans, which is called the Twenty and Four. It's a national organization. Very few people know about it. It's not very uh, widely disseminated. You have to be asked to be in it. Uh, of course, the American flag. And the reason I have the Palace Athena is that when I was in the Women's Army Corps, we wore the Palace Athena on our collar, which you know was our designation of who we belonged to. And then in the 1975, I think, or 76, somewhere in there, about the time I was getting out, they officially dissolved the Women's Army Corps and uh, they only left the, the U.S. Army. But after I had gotten out of basic training, which was females only, when I went to school at Fort Rucker, Alabama, which was probably, I guess, July of 74, May, June, July of 74, that spring, that's when I actually uh, had to wear the U.S. Army insignia. And I belong to the single corps, so I would have a different insignia on my collar. And the other thing is, this is the medal we were just talking about, which is called the uh, Korean Defense Service Medal, which is relatively new in the scheme of things. And I think it should be recognized, because like I said, even though I was not in a combat situation, we had to be very uh, cognizant of the role we were playing in that country, you know, and uh, I think it's still, you know, very, very important role today. So it is, it is. Mhm. Mm but that's why I, I wear my hat to remind me of all the different groups that I belong to and and who I who I still value. So. Is there anything else you'd like to t talk about? No, I think that would be it. Um, I'm very proud of all my family members and all the people that I know that have served. Um, I think it's, it's a very unique situation where uh, even as a young person, when I look at all the sailors, and they're, to me they're, they're all kids that just got out of high school because I've taught high school for, for 20 years or whatever. And uh, I look at them and I'm like, okay, well, now you've got the uniform on and I so you hold yourself accordingly and you behave accordingly. When you're wearing that uniform, you wear it proudly and respectfully. And, and you, I, that's the way I really feel. I mean, if, if you're going to, you know, make unwise decisions and, and be a silly teenager or something, then don't be seen in that uniform when you're doing it, you know. And uh, I think that we need to tell our young people that they, they should have pride in themselves and in their country. There's a lot of things going on that could be better, 
but I don't know any place in the world that's that's at least you know we we have a good country i'm very I'm very pleased to be a American so works for me. I would like to take this time and tell you um, I've enjoyed hearing your history and your story. Um, you're amazing. Well, thank you. And I feel honored being able to take part in this. Um, I also want to thank you for you being someone who has served our country and honored us with your service time. And I want to thank you for that. You're welcome. So.